Good morning, everybody. My name is Markus Leitner. I'm with Environment Agency Austria, and I'm delighted to welcome you today to the Placard webinar um, on foresight, and we're focusing on exploring the use of foresight methods in climate resilience. At the beginning, I would like to um, give you some housekeeping rules. Please ensure that your microphone is switched off. Um, we would like to inform you that the webinar will be recorded and um, helping us to put together all the points that you are raising. Um, you see um, in the bottom line of your WebEx connection that there is a Q&A field. So whenever you have a question or want to raise a point, please use this Q&A um, facility to put the question forward. There's also the possibility later on, for example, to forward emails to us with topics related to the webinar. As you can see, we have now an hour and a half, and the way the webinar is structured is we are looking at two parts. The first part is related to the introduction to placard. Um, we will introduce the webinar purpose, and then we would have three keynotes with distinguished um, speakers. And the second part will then focus on the discussion, and we will focus on three guiding questions. Uh, which you can see here, but we will come to that a little bit later. And finally, we will close with follow-up work because there is also follow-up activities in this direction from the placard side. To inform you about placard, placard is a Horizon 2020 project and we are focusing on um, connecting climate adaptation and disaster risk reduction. And as you can see here beside the web page link, which is here, you also see the key goal, and this is related to coordinating and knowledge exchange, providing a platform for different uh, communities who work on disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation, coming from research, policy, and also practice, and across different scales, so European, transnational, national, regional, and partly even local. So you see the purpose of this webinar and you see the image on your left side is joining forces. So how can CCA and DRR better collaborate and seize um, opportunities? In today's webinar, we want to showcase the potential of foresight methods and the five futures of Europe that was put forward by Juncker in terms of climate action, but we're also looking at the potential climate hazards and impacts. And at the last point, we will discuss the potential in three different policy fields. Let's come to our first distinguished keynote speaker, uh, who is Rob Swart from Wageningen Environmental Research, and he will provide an introduction and the placard foresight activities. Please, Rob, the floor is yours. Oh. You have to share or to give me the right to present my presentation, Marcus or Susanna. You have it. Okay. Right. Okay. Thanks, Marcus, for your introduction. Uh, my role is to brief you, briefly uh, tell you something about the Placar project, what it is about and why we think that foresight is actually relevant for the activities in this project. Uh, many of you may be familiar with this kind of graph uh, showing actually the number of disasters and uh, with the exception of the earthquakes in brown and the diseases in purple, uh, all of these disasters are weather or climate related uh, and they're increasing. So there is really a, a rationale to, uh, to look for connections between the two areas. But in practice, um, the two fields are actually separated to a large extent, both in science uh, and also in policy and practice. Uh, in climate change adaptation, the community sees disaster risk reduction maybe as one of their uh, areas of concern, maybe a uh, sector, uh, along with many other sectors. While the people in disaster risk reduction regard climate change adaptation as uh, something maybe in the margin of what they're doing uh, because it's too long term. 
So we think that uh, there is actually a reason to, uh, to explore the potential to connect these two communities and try to find synergies. And both communities also have their own international uh, policy framework. Of course, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change for Adaptation and the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction. Um, we think that it's useful actually to look at the, the policy cycle that is often used, especially in the context of disaster risk reduction, from prevention, long-term prevention, to preparedness, to response and relief, and then after an event has taken place, the recovery phase. Now, in general, uh, even if uh, all these phases are usually uh, occurring in, say, high-level policy documents, um, in reality, the emphasis in disaster risk reduction is very much on the event itself and the preparedness for the event and the response, and not so much on the longer-term issues of prevention which is actually the emphasis in uh, climate change adaptation. Uh, that was actually also the reason for the European Commission to, uh, uh, to establish this, this project. Um, and uh, what this project hopes to do is to provide a sort of common space for the communities, the two communities to come together, share experiences, uh, talk, uh, think of new ways forward, uh, communicate, uh, share knowledge and so forth. Um, in the end, what we uh, hope to do in the project is to uh, strengthen research uh, programs and uh, also institutions working in these two areas. Now, Foresight is uh, actually there are different uh, lines of, of work in Placard, and, and one of them is, uh, is Foresight. And um, when we were actually thinking about uh, how to develop this project, we thought that Foresight uh, is actually a, a tool, an approach that could actually help to, uh, to bring the two communities together. I think it's important to realize that, uh, especially in climate change, there's a lot of emphasis on quantitative modeling um, of scenarios, and by definition almost, models can only capture a very limited set of variables. Um, and actually the issues that we are now talking about actually are very complex. It's not only science, technology, economics, but it's also politics, behavior, uh, social, psychological factors, matters, and, and this is the kind of more qualitative approach for which various foresight uh, methods can be, uh, can be used. Um, this webinar is not the first uh, activity in this area, already one and a half year ago, in Vienna, there was a, a first workshop to explore these ideas, focusing very much on uh, mega trends. Uh, we produce a report, Foresight for Policy and Decision Makers, that you can find on the Placar website, and a number of other uh, products were developed, like a policy brief. There are some blogs on the website that might be of interest uh, to you. Now, for those who are not familiar with Foresight, uh, I don't have enough time to say a lot about it, but. The first definition is very complex, actually, but it uh, does capture what foresight is about. It's systematic, it's participatory, it's focusing on the future, uh, gathering intelligence, uh, medium to long-term vision building uh, to support decision-making, but also to mobilize joint actions. Quite a complicated definition, maybe, but maybe the, the triangle is, uh, is a little bit easier because it also shows that it's more than just a number of uh, projections. It's not only talking about the future, it's also visioning, thinking about what the future could be, what it should be, but also shaping it. So there's always a, an element of, uh, of action uh, involved in, uh, in foresight activities. So it's not about predicting the future, it's uh, intending to help us build the future. Now, in Europe and also elsewhere, it's, uh, all kinds of uh, methods are actually used, uh, primarily in the areas of uh, technology development, but also research. And now we think that it could also be interesting uh, to explore foresight more in connecting these two policy areas. Now, I already mentioned that, uh, well, I think many of you might actually recognize at least this kind of spaghetti graph. In, in climate change, the discussion is very much dominated by quantitative model analysis. 
um, using integrated assessment models, climate impact models, economic models. The foresight, uh, maybe also because of the emphasis that I already mentioned on the shorter term, uh, foresight is not used that often in the UK. They uh, they used it, and usually if you actually look at what what is happening in that sector, it's more qualitative. It's kind of different from uh, this, from uh, climate change adaptation. So now we have a number of uh, hypotheses that uh, we would like to test um, in the project, but also in this this webinar, and that is that uh, foresight we think can. Uh, can add diversity to this the set of tools uh, that are now dominating the climate change adaptation debate. We also uh, think, and we would like to have that uh, confirmed, that uh, foresight can actually help to um, emphasize more the prevention step in this disaster risk reduction cycle. So taking into account more the longer term uh, aspects of weather-related disasters. Uh, and then, of course, uh, very important because of this action component, we hope that we can actually uh, contribute to joint solutions, synergies, and avoiding trade-offs between the two areas. But then we have to be specific because it's a complex question. Now, the aims of the, this webinar, as Mark has already uh, introduced, to discuss the potential of foresight for uh, developing solutions that are developed jointly, integrated solutions. Uh, our idea was actually to use the opportunity provided by um, the white paper on the future of Europe that was presented by President Juncker last year. In fact, uh, the next speaker was involved in an analysis uh, looking at primarily, I would say, climate change mitigation uh, so what do these futures for Europe imply for mitigation? And this exercise, we hope to uh, do the same thing, but then more for uh, climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction. And since we have only limited time in this webinar, we hope that uh, the ideas that will be coming out of this, uh, uh, this webinar can be used to design uh, a longer face-to-face -face workshop in autumn. And the three uh, EU policy areas that Marcus was already referring to are the uh, adaptation strategy of the EU that is currently being evaluated and might be revised next year. There is the EU civil protection mechanism in the area of DRR. And as many of you might uh, know, after Horizon 2020, there will be a, a new research program, FP9, that is currently uh, being designed and we might actually have an in Back on that uh, process. Now, my last uh, slide. So, actually, the, the, the things that we would like to do today in this webinar. First, uh, listen to Jonathan Conventa about the five futures for Europe uh, and what do, they, what do they mean for the climate. Um, Ian Holman is going to tell us about the risks, the impacts, potential impacts in the future, and then we will have a more interactive uh, session with uh, all participants about the challenges related to uh, climate risks and the uncertain future. That's it. Uh, back to Marcus. Thank you very much, Rob. Um, related to the uh, participants, are there is there any question that you would like to raise immediately? You can either unmute your microphone or you can put it forward in the Q&A area of the WebEx tool. If this is not the case, we will directly move uh, to our next speaker, um, who is Jonathan Gaventa and he's the director of the E3G consultancy based in Brussels. Um, so please, uh, Jonathan, the floor is yours. Th thank you, Marcus, and thank you, Rob. Um, I feel privileged to be part of this webinar. Um, I'm, I'm not a climate foresight specialist, uh, but rather focus on climate politics and, and climate policy. Um, E3G is a, is a think tank um, based in Brussels, London, Berlin, and Washington. Uh, with, a, with a large program focused on uh, on EU climate and, and clean energy politics and, and policy. 
Um, what I'm going to talk through is um, is the future of Europe and and the future of, of climate action. Um, our work has been more focused on the mitigation end, as you said, but is of course also relevant to uh, what we call managing climate risk, um, which of course includes um, uh, adaptation, uh, but also um, but but also some of the disaster risk reduction elements uh, as well. Um, now, the reason that we are interested in this area is uh, is that it's a very live political process. Uh, European leaders have kicked off a future of Europe discussion on the future form, capacity, and focus of the EU. Now, this hasn't been primarily or or even largely about climate change so far, um, but our contention is that climate is is and should be central to the conversation of, of the of the future of Europe. Uh, first of all, because Europe's future prosperity depends both on successfully managing climate risk, but also managing uh, an orderly transition to a zero carbon economy. Um, but beyond that, we also see that the future form and capacity and, and design and capabilities of the EU will also shape Europe's capacity to deal with climate risks and to guide that transition. Um, so this presentation will outline um, the scenarios that have been developed by the European Commission on the Future of Europe and uh, give some initial thoughts on their implications for European climate governance and perhaps for climate foresight over, over the long term. Uh, first of all, a quick look at the, the timeline about, um, uh, about how the politics of this are, are shaping up and, and what's happened so far. The Future of Europe conversation um, really got going um, most prominently following um, the UK's uh, referendum in 2016 uh, to, to, to leave the EU. It's not That wasn't the only driver, but it was a major trigger for European leaders to, uh, to look at what the EU um, would look like uh, as 27 rather than 28, uh, and also uh, to, to try to address um, perhaps some of the strains and, and, and problems that, that led to, to that vote going uh, how it did. Um, so the first reaction was in September 2016 with the Bratislava Declaration uh, from, from the EU 27. Um, now this was a statement that focused almost exclusively on issues like migration and security uh, with no explicit climate or sustainability focus. Uh, however, this was followed up in, in March uh, last year with the, the Rome Declaration on the 60th anniversary of the Treaty of Rome, um, and this gave, a, I guess, a more comprehensive statement of, uh, of future priorities, uh, which did include uh, environmental sustainability as, as one of the core competencies uh, of, of the EU. Uh, around the same time, the Commission came forward with the Future of Europe White Paper, which is uh, what we're going to be discussing today. And then uh, through the rest of 2017, follow this up with a series of thematic uh, reflection papers on, uh, on, on different uh, sectors and dimensions, including the social dimension of Europe, um, harnessing globalization, the economic and monetary union, uh, the future of European defense, and uh, EU finances and the EU budget. Now, in parallel to the Commission work, uh, we also saw the European Council uh, start a process of their own called the Leaders Agenda, uh, where EU heads of state and government um, at their European Council meetings uh, discuss uh, different angles uh, of, of the future of Europe uh, and have also agreed to run uh, national uh, conversations and consultative events on, on the future of Europe, so there's opportunities for citizens to get involved. Now, this is all meant to be leading up towards a summit in Sibiu, Romania in May 2019, uh, where some initial conclusions uh, should could, uh, and could be drawn. So there's still scope um, for, uh, for stakeholders uh, uh, you know, across the EU27 um, to, to contribute towards the direction of, uh, of travel and to contribute to those overall uh, conclusions. Uh, the slide just shows um, the, uh, the, the, the two reports that we're going to be talking through today. Um, the first is the, the white paper on the future of Europe published by the European Commission. And uh, E3G followed this uh, together with our partners at IEP and uh, the Heinrich Boll Stiftung uh, with an analysis of our own unpacking that white paper uh, with, with a focus on what those scenarios might mean uh, for, for climate action. Uh, and particularly on, on mitigation. Uh, so the, the, the web links are, are there on the slides for you. 
So first, a, a very quick overview of the of the five scenarios uh, together that, that the European Commission developed and outlined. And the first is uh, carrying on, um, which in the Commission's words, the EU27 focuses on delivering its positive reform agenda. The scenario is basically just a continuation of, of, of the current context. The second scenario is nothing but the single market, uh, where the EU is gradually recentered onto single market issues and, and retreat some other areas. The third scenario is those who want to do, who, those who want more do more. Um, and this, uh, this allows member states uh, that, that want to go further to, uh, to, to reach agreements in, in specific areas. The fourth is doing less more efficiently. Uh, so uh, there's, there's a focus on, on going faster and further in some areas, but, but rolling back from others. And finally, doing much more together where the EU's overall competences and focus uh, get, gets expanded. So diving in now to, to what each of these uh, might mean for uh, climate mitigation and managing climate risk. Uh, so the first scenario of carry on where the EU27 stick to the, their current course and you know we see you know, the EU efforts really focusing on things like areas like strengthening the single markets and increasing investment. Uh, and this could include a positive dimension, including areas such as energy infrastructure and, uh, and digital, for, for, for example. Uh, and we expect no major change of direction in terms of governance or uh, of focus. Now, in terms of potential upsides for climate action, uh, we would see in this scenario the EU maintaining um, an international role on climate change although this may be hampered by some, uh, some of the domestic disagreements that we've been seeing so far on the level of ambition. Uh, we would also expect to see continued incremental but not transformational modernization of, of energy markets, which uh, over time would open the door to higher proportions of renewables, active demand, digital technologies, et cetera. Um, and we would also expect some member states to drive forward their own climate ambitions in parallel to the EU targets, uh, where others stick to just the bare minimum. Now, the downsides of carrying on as, uh, as we are now um, would essentially be that the EU struggles to increase its targets in line with the Paris Agreement, and we would expect to see you know, a further widening of divisions between actors. Uh, we, we would expect to see uh, markets and clean energy technologies growing in the EU, um, but we would probably not see uh, a, a very cohesive low carbon industrial strategy. Um, and we would you know, expect uh, some disruption to high carbon industries by both technological and demographic change as well as climate policy, but without a clear transition plan, which leads to the risk of, of, of backlash uh, against climate action in some parts of the EU. The second scenario is nothing but the single market. So this is where the EU scales back its, its competencies, its ambition only on single market issues. Uh, with a really strong focus on uh, reducing regulatory barriers at EU level, uh, and there's little appetite to expand policy into new areas. Now, this was a, a trickier one to analyze in terms in terms of upsides. Um, you know, we did think that potentially strengthening single market rules could challenge some of the high carbon incumbents. Um, for example, preventing capacity payments for coal power plants. For example, uh, we could see that a more integrated internal energy market could facilitate trade in, in, in renewables and you know uh, technological innovations could potentially spread more more easily but really in practice the climate upsides from the scenario are probably limited in terms of the downsides of this scenario well we would uh, expect to see a, a push for deregulation and a rollback of climate policy uh, fairly widely um, now this would create a, you know, the risk of a race to the bottom on environmental standards uh, and, and, a, and a regulatory gap at, uh, at, at EU level, uh, where targets are either weakened or, or just simply ignored, and we'd be seeing um, even greater divergence between different countries. As a result of this, the EU would no longer be a strong force in international climate negotiations, and uh, leadership would have to rely on individual countries. Uh, the third scenario that we that we explored is uh, those who want more do more. Now this is uh, this is the scenario of the multi-speed Europe. So this is where 
you know, you'd have uh, coalitions of the willing emerging to work together in specific policy areas. Uh, and this could even include instituting legal or budgetary arrangements in these areas, uh, like already exist in Schengen and, and the Eurozone. And, and other member states uh, could have the opportunity to join these cooperative efforts over time. Uh, now, so this, this scenario does uh, provide an opportunity to, to bank increased climate ambition in progressive member states, rather than making everyone go at the same pace. So countries uh, like France and Sweden, who have signaled an intention to, to raise climate ambition, uh, would be able to do so um, without implying that others can go more slowly. And so that means that those actions would be additional to, to current efforts. Um, we could also see some cross-border initiatives develop on low-carbon resources, uh, such as the North Seas Grids initiative focused on offshore wind energy. Uh, we could see these being formalized and expanded. The downside to this, however, for climate action are that there would be a further loss of consistency on climate and clean energy policy across Europe. Uh, this could put the internal energy market under even greater strain when it comes to, to low carbon energy and also challenge notions of uh, EU solidarity. Uh, more fundamentally, perhaps, um, this scenario could see uh, a dynamic emerge in which countries who are already lacking behind on climate action uh, feel empowered uh, to do even less um, because policy is no longer EU-wide, but rather focused to, to those who, who uh, feel inclined to take it forward. Now, the fourth scenario is doing less more efficient, uh, efficiently. And in this scenario, the EU would scale back its focus to a limited number of policy areas, um, but would become more effective at reaching agreements and delivering on the, on the stated goals. So it's shrinking the focus, um, but, but uh, becoming stronger on delivery. In this scenario, the EU would step away from areas in which its added value or competencies are limited. Um, and the, the white paper lists areas like regional development, public health, social policy, and state aid uh, as examples of areas that the EU would step away from. Now, for climate action, it's a little bit unclear. Um, the potential upsides is you know, climate is fundamentally a cross-border issue with clear added value. So, you know, potentially we could see even more focus on, uh, on climate change in, in, in this scenario. And, and also, of course, doing things more efficiently is, uh, is almost by definition a good thing, and this, this, this counts in, uh, in climate as well as other fields. Uh, now, the downsides for climate action is you know, it could be that doing less includes doing less on climate and clean energy. Um, the, uh, the white paper also said in this, in this scenario, common standards are set to a minimum. Uh, so this means that you may be less likely to set ambitious standards for uh, efficient products, efficient uh, vehicles, buildings, etc. And also uh, rolling back on, uh, on regional development means that the EU could be less able to respond to the social challenges of the energy transition uh, and also perhaps uh, less able uh, to focus on, on climate adaptation at regional uh, level. The final scenario is, uh, is doing much more together. So this sees a considerable expansion in EU capacities and remit. Uh, according to the white paper, there is consensus that neither the EU 27 as it is, nor European countries on their own are well equipped enough to face the challenges of the day. Uh, it also says cooperation between all member states goes further than ever before in all domains. Now, the upsides for this uh, could be that the EU expands its remits on climate action into new areas, uh, for example, uh, into a, a low carbon industrial strategy uh, or on supporting communities most exposed to climate risks and climate impacts. Um, the international role of the EU on climate change could also be strengthened here. The EU 27 continues to lead the global fight against climate change and strengthens its role as the world's largest humanitarian and development aid donor, uh, in the words of the Commission's white paper. Now, the downsides for climate action are really uh, about the, you know, the, the viability of this scenario. Uh, there's no real indication on how agreement will be reached to move in this direction. Uh, Given existing divisions in EU climate politics and I, I would say EU governance politics more generally. 
so that was a that was a very rapid run through of of the basic scenarios uh, that that have been set out uh, and, and are on the table uh, in in the course of the future of Europe debate. Um, we see important questions that should be addressed uh, about the future European capacities needed both to guide the low carbon transition and to respond to, to climate risk. Uh, so we see these, the climate discussion, the future of Europe discussion um, should be intimately linked, uh, but has been actually relatively absent so far. The next year or so is a key window of opportunity for the climate community to, to join this discussion. Um, and I think, uh, you know, even though we focus more on the mitigation side, uh, it will also be important for the climate risk community uh, to, to link those scenarios into the discussions on the future uh, EU capabilities. Um, and for, for those more engaged in, in climate foresight methodologies, I think what the future of Europe debate shows is that actually future governance models uh, can't seem to be fixed. Uh, it's a very live and, and open discussion, and all five of those potential scenarios are currently on the table as, as kind of deliberate uh, changes in governance. And then, of course, there are the, uh, the, the kind of the unexpected changes and, and, and the events uh, that, that we can expect to happen uh, over time. So I, I hope that's, uh, that's some, some initial food for thoughts, and, um, and thanks for, again for the invitation to participate. Thank you very much, Jonathan. I think that was a very good and comprehensive overview about potential future developments and perspective of, of Europe. Um, I would like to open the floor uh, now to the uh, participants um, in this webinar. Um, are there any questions that you would like to put forward either in the Q&A or you can unmute your microphone or raise your hand um, and then you can ask your question. Yes, there is one from Rob, please. Yes, and uh, thanks, uh, Jonathan. In fact, the Q&A is not working, I think. Uh, I tried that, so that should be open. But actually, my question was um, um, the five futures, as uh, presented in the, the white paper, are all positive in a way, in the sense that, uh, and that's logical because it's coming from the EU, uh, but there would be actually a more negative future um, in which more countries than uh, the UK would, would leave the, the Union, and which would also have major implications for both managing climate risks and climate mitigation. Uh, so our exercise that we're now doing and that we hope to pursue uh, may actually benefit from adding a sixth case in which uh, that would be the case, so a more negative case. So I was wondering if uh, Jonathan uh, in this project actually has uh, also considered this and if it would be useful for future work. The, the, thanks, Rob. Um, no, in, in, indeed, I think this is a, this is a very important point. Um, I'm actually joining the webinar from, from Rome. Um, so I'm I am uh, I'm very conscious of uh, of political risk around both the eurozone and and the uh, and the EU more more generally. Uh, I think there is value in looking at some more extreme scenarios, um, including unexpected events. Um, but perhaps those extreme scenarios can look in in multiple directions. Uh, I, I should mention that um, that there have already been a few efforts to develop a, a sixth scenario. Um, by some of the environmental NGOs uh, who felt that the initial five scenarios did not give uh, a sufficient view of the future in which uh, sustainable development considerations are fully incorporated into the mission and capabilities of the EU. Uh, so you could see a more positive uh, sixth scenario um, where, where those sustainable development values are, are central uh, to all of the EU's action. And you could see a more challenging, uh, you know, sort of uh, scenario um, in which uh, divisions grow ever greater, um, and and you would you would either see a kind of a, 
a less functional EU or even as, as you raise uh, the potential for, for other countries to leave over the long, over the long term. I think for the for the purposes of the future of Europe conversation, uh, I, part of the the reason that the scenarios were constructed in this way were to provide uh, a sense of the direction of travel that could be chosen. Um, so that's I guess that's why they were all relatively positive. Although um, you know, for many of us, the uh, the scenario of of only the single market would be would, would be quite challenged. So um, I, I think it's an important addition um, that these scenarios don't represent the full spectrum of, of possible futures for the EU, um, but rather uh, future directions that the current leadership could choose to move in. Yeah, thank you very much for these uh, latest insights. Um, if you look now at the image that you see on the screen, you see that we um, did a nice cartoon related to the five different futures for the EU or Europe that you can see, which is on the bottom, and you see the different uh, glasses and lenses. You can look um, at Europe through them, and above you see the different uh, challenges. If you uh, look at it and if you think about the futures that you've just heard about, um, can you maybe come back to us and tell us a little bit on looking at climate change adaptation, disaster risk reduction, who would you see as the main actors that shall be considered, which can be European, transnational, national, um, that would be very welcome if you can step in and give us your thoughts. I see the chat is, uh, for example, working if the Q&A is not working, but you can also raise your hand and unmute your microphone. Maybe letting you know uh, who we were thinking about when it comes to the public sector, especially um, there are already strong ties with the different DGs, so they are DG Echo or DG Klima, um, but it's also the case for DG JRC and um, the Joint Research Center and the European Environment Agency who are active actors in that field from environment or disaster risk reduction, but there are also strong ties with the national experts who are either the Sendai focal point or the delegates to adaptation working groups on the uh, on the European level. Um, maybe you can also come up with some thoughts about private sector or civil society or maybe other organized groups that you would see as a relevant actor um, to involve um, in future placard activities in that field. That would be very much welcome. If this is not the case, you can still come back to us in via the chat function or also email us. Um, I would then move forward to our next speaker, who is Ian Holman from Cranfield University. And he will talk you through the topic of potential future climate in terms of climatic hazards and impacts expected for Europe. Um, please, Ian, um, now it's your turn. Sorry, that's not started at the beginning. I don't know why that is. Okay, thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure as a representative from the Impressions Project talking about some of the sort of the future issues around the, the climate of Europe. Um, I don't expect you to read this slide, which is an infographic from the European Environment Agency's Climate Change Impacts and Vulnerability in Europe 2016 report. But just to focus on the fact that this shows that the, the risks facing Europe um, are spatially variable. 
but also if you just look at the, the text there, it's a lot of increases or decreases of current climate hazards that we currently face. So that's changes in the risk associated with drought, floods, storms, fires, heat waves, extreme rainfall events. So not many new and emerging risks, but largely a change in the existing risks that we currently face. And that's not entirely surprising when we look at this figure from the IPCC's working group report, working group one, which is looking at the sources of uncertainty in the climate change projections um, that we use to understand the future climate of Europe. And this is looking in the top graph around European winter precipitation and the lower graph European winter temperature. And what we see that in the sort of next 2010, 2030 years, the uncertainty in our understanding of the future climate of Europe is dominated by both the internal or natural climate variability um, of our of the climatic system and also in blue the climate model uncertainty. And it's only as we progress later into the century into the sort of mid century that the uncertainties associated with which um, uh, emissions trajectory or greenhouse gas emissions trajectory that we follow becomes apparent. And so because of this um, uh, changing source of the uncertainty in what's driving Europe's future climate, there is value in looking uh, beyond the sort of the, the next 20 or 30 years towards the later part of the century. And that's very much what the Impressions Project has been doing, which has really been trying to understand the consequences of high-end climate and socioeconomic scenarios on Europe at multiple scales from the local through to the continental. And when I talk about high-end climate change, these are climate scenarios in which the global mean temperature increase exceeds 2 degrees centigrade. Um, so beyond the sort of the, the Paris Agreement. And looking at these high-end scenarios is particularly relevant because if we look at our current um, trajectory in this sort of black line of the historical emissions of greenhouse gases, they're following a trend which is not along the line that is associated with RCP 2.6. The RCPs, or representative concentration pathways, are the new, uh, the new sort of uh, climate change scenarios that are being used. And if we look at the figures on the right, which are the global, uh, global mean average temperature increases, you'll see that RCP 2.6 is the main one that is holding temperatures below um, one and a half degrees. So given that we're not currently we're not currently following that trajectory, the Impressions Project has been looking at the higher warming scenarios of RCP 4.5 and RCP 8.5. So what does that mean for Europe? This is um, showing the an, an ensemble mean, so an average of a number of climate models for that higher RCP 8.5, that high warming scenario. And on the left, it shows that the, Euro the annual mean temperature in Europe will be generally three degrees warmer, but it'll be higher in parts of the Mediterranean and particularly in Northern Europe. Similarly, there's a very strong um, uh, north-south gradient in the change in annual precipitation, with Southern Europe getting drier on average Northern Europe getting wetter. But as I mentioned earlier, this is an ensemble mean. And when we look at the individual climate models, again, you don't need to look at the, uh, the actual values, but just looking at the spatial patterns of the colors um, and the sort of the, the, the darkness of the shades, you can see that the different climate models for the same uh, climate change scenario of RCP 8.5 gives slightly different results. So there's uncertainty in the climate change that will um, that Europe will be facing. 
Now, when we put those climate models, those climate change scenarios through models, um, we, we can get some idea of some of the impacts that Europe might face. So here we have two sets of um, changes in average uh, monthly river flows expressed as a percentage change relative to the current. And the, the shaded area represents the ensemble range, so the range of outcomes using those different climate models. The blue is RCP 4.5, so the lower warming scenario, and the lower pink ones, RCP 8.5. So what we see in um, the river Lul in northern Sweden is quite a significant increase in spring flows associated with earlier snow melt but actually a general increase in flows um, above the current due to that um, north or south to north precipitation gradient shown earlier. In contrast, when we look at the, the River Targus in, in Iberia, so this is a, a river basin spanning parts of Spain and Portugal, we see that there are very strong uh, projected decreases in river flows, with those decreases, decreases increasing over time and with increasing warming scenarios, such that in the future, uh, by the end of the century, the mean river flows might well have decreased by about 50% throughout the year. This then feeds into changes in sort of the water availability. So this is the water balance, the difference between precipitation and evapotranspiration. And what we can see, we have here the sort of RCP 2.6 in the top left. So that sort of future climate in which we're meeting the, the Paris target. And we can see over much of Europe, relatively little change compared to uh, the baseline, but as we go through RCP 4.5 and in the lower left RCP 8.5, we're seeing very significant decreases in water availability in southern Europe and larger increases, large increases in northern Europe. And these in, these impacts will have quite significant outcomes for the sort of the reliability of public water supply irrigation water availability of food production, for hydropower generation, for the ability to meet the environmental flows required by, for example, the Water Framework Directive, um, navigation and recreation, but also flood risk management. And another example here from the impressions modeling of a particular tree species, this is Scott's pine. And the main thing to notice here with these plots on the right is that the purple colors indicate that over the whole of, pretty much over the whole of Scotland, there is a decreasing suitability of the climate for this particular species. This is an iconic species and actually forms part of the centerpiece of the Scottish government's ambitious reforestation targets. However, those impacts are driven by the climate change um, acting on those particular sectors, on the, the rivers and on the, the tree species. But we know that the impacts are affected by cross-sectoral interactions. So for example, the impacts on crop yields and crop production will depend upon the water resource availability. And we also know that those impacts will be strongly conditioned by the choices and institutions um, in the future of society. So when we start thinking about the future evolution beyond perhaps the timescale of the, the five futures of Europe that J Jonathan described, we obviously know that observations are not possible in the future. And so within the Impressions Project, we've been working with the, the Global Shared Socioeconomic Pathways, or SSPs, which are the new um, socioeconomic scenarios that have been developed, and have been sort of downscaling them through a participatory process to develop European SSPs. And there are four, four SSPs that we've been using, SSP 
1, 3, 4 and 5. SSP1 is the, a sustainability world and this is, would be more akin to Jonathan's very positive sixth future of Europe that he was talking about. SSP3 in the, the bottom right is a regional rivalry world and would be much more akin to Rob's very negative future for Europe as a as a, as a disintegration of the European Union and the formation sort of, of, of national um, of nations competing against each other. SSP5 is the fossil fuel development world where basically there has been an almost complete lack of climate action um, and putting the, the Paris Accord into, into action. And SSP4 is an inequality world. So we have these different scenarios or SSPs that we've been working with stakeholders um, through a participatory process to try and develop robust and transformative solutions um, for high-end climate change. So I'm just going to focus on some of the, 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 the modeling work. So those um, SSPs, those socioeconomic scenarios, have been integrated with the climate change scenarios through their emissions. So SSP5 and SSP3 have, are expected to have high emissions, so they've been linked with a high climate change scenario, and vice versa for SSP1 and 4. And then those integrated scenarios have been used within the modelling, and this shows the future European land use um, that's come out of the Impressions Integrated Assessment Platform 2, where quantified versions of those SSPs reflecting European changes in European diets and environmental preferences in food trade and technological innovation and the like have been implemented into the models. If we look at the, the top two lines, we'll see that the, the European land use um, isn't changing particularly strongly, but when we go into the different um, integrated scenarios of climate and socioeconomic change, we see very different outcomes for the European landscape, from agricultural expansion and forest contraction through to scenarios where the agricultural area decreases or contracts very markedly. And these would have very significant impacts for the rural, for rural employment, for landscape, tourism, um, and for biodiversity. And similarly, when we look at the, the vulnerability of society to cope with um, water over-exploitation, we again see from the, 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 the figures in the, the top right, we look at the, the, the lower climate change scenarios with the SSPs, that's 4.5, and the RCP 8.5s at the bottom. We see a difference between the RCP 4.5 and 8.5, so an increasing vulnerability of Europe in society to, water, to the stresses associated with water over-exploitation, but we also see very strong differences driven by the socio-economic futures. So just to, to very quickly con uh, conclude, um, climate change will have both regionally and sectorally varying impacts across Europe. So there'll be places, there'll be winners and losers in Europe associated with those climate um, risks. But the impacts of those um, changes in European climate will be affected by the sort of the, the, the trade-offs between sectors, but also by future society in terms of its governance models, its economic development, societal values and behaviour. And such futures or, or, or socioeconomic scenarios have formed a central component of the impressions research with stakeholders on understanding um, future impacts and the sort of adaptive, mitigative and transformative responses that society might take to those futures. But what the modelling in particular has shown is that the impacts and vulnerability of future change are often more strongly influenced by the socioeconomic change than even the high-end climate change. And I think in the context of um, the, the futures for Europe that Jonathan presented um, and 
his sort of concluding comment about future governance models not being uh, fixed, this really shows that there are important opportunities for society, and particularly for Europe, um, to influence the consequences and also the opportunities of, of climate change. That the future is not set in stone, and the choices we make now will have major impacts for Europe's future. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jonathan, for this excellent uh, presentation. I would like to open now the floor to our participants and ask if there are first any certain questions of understanding that you would like to put forward either in the chat or by raising your hand. If this is not the case, and I was showing this uh, cartoon before, and you see on the bottom again the five uh, potential futures for Europe, but also further up here, um, the um, climatic hazards that we just heard about. And as um, Ian already mentioned, there are of course uh, partly winners and losers, and for some fields there are opportunities, but for others there are also quite some challenges. And the question I want to put forward to our participants is also related to um, the issue of um, what are those climate challenges and where, in which fields do we need to work on um, to actually increase our resilience. Uh, could be related to hazards such as floods, heat waves, droughts, forest fires or maybe migration, but it would be very interesting to hear your point of views about the climate challenges, also in the perspective of the futures of Europe. Who wants to start first? Please raise your hand or use the chat function. Yes, there is a, race, a hand raised by Rosalind Cook, please. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, works perfect. Great. Well, hi everyone and good morning. Um, I'll just introduce myself. My name's Rosalind Cook and I work at the UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction, but in my previous life I worked at E3G um, alongside my colleague Jonathan, who presented earlier. So I'd just to try and give some thoughts on your questions, Marcus, and I give these more in a personal capacity. Um, I think you asked about where we should focus on, and I think there really has to be a focus on the, on the most vulnerable and to really understand what these different scenarios and what these different choices means. Um, we can see looking at the climate impacts in Europe, though they are having the greatest impact on the most vulnerable. So they're affecting, for example, old people in heat waves or SMEs. Um, SMEs are wiped out after floods. And we, we some of the studies are showing, for example, that um, in so some of the floods that we've had in European countries, that 50% of the SMEs in that region haven't recovered after after two years. At the same time, we know that um, SMEs are a huge part of the, of the European economy. So it's, I think we need a better understanding of where are the other vulnerable groups in Europe and what, what do these different climate scenarios mean for those different groups. Then as a, as a second point, trying to draw some thoughts on, on that first presentation which looked at the differences between the disaster risk reduction community and the climate change adaptation community. Um, I in many ways came from the climate change adaptation community and now I work in the disaster risk reduction community and I think what I can see is that historically the disaster risk reduction community has tended to work more on this historical 
data and looking at the past, what's happened to plan for the future, and there's a strong realization that that just doesn't work anymore because climate change completely changes the risk profile and is changing it radically. And I think many are now trying to really accelerate efforts to, to understand how they can use, look at the future and understand future projections to, on on how that has implications on their civil protection agencies. In a lot of these different scenarios that we saw, both from, in particular from the presentation by Ian, I can see that, you know, these, uh, particularly at the high end, but also not not only at the high end, has the potential to completely overwhelm civil protection agencies. So I think it's really important that we um, develop a tool using foresight or also just thinking like how can we develop some tools to like help civil protection agencies to stress test their systems against different climate impacts and scenarios. So I'm thinking in the way that that banks have to stress test their their systems against different unfavorable economic scenarios. I think this is this is sort of one potential idea that we could we could bring in to help the disaster risk reduction community and bring together those communities on a concrete um, way to work together. So that, that's one one suggestion for, from my side. Um, and I think as a last po point, I really welcome the, the presentation looking at these high-end scenarios. I think this is really relevant and really important. Uh, and then that brings me back to, to sort of my first point that I think that was a really useful presentation, but we need to understand what that means in reality and to talk to these different groups that will be Im impacted on that. And ultimately, that needs to then go at a high level political decision and discussion on what level of climate risk are we prepared to accept and, and what does that mean for the changes and the choices that we make in, in our society. So I think this those elements of what level of climate risk are we prepared to accept is, is critically important for the future of Europe discussion. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much, Rosaline, for your very, very um, relevant points. Um, this also brings me back to the previous question that uh, I raised, and it's related to the different actors that shall be involved. If you're mentioning now the most vulnerable groups uh, related to maybe old people or children during heat waves or maybe poor housing and SMEs that are impacted by floods, um, what kind of organizations or what kind of uh, NGOs do you see that are more or less uh, representing those groups who could become part of, for example, the second uh, Placard Foresight Workshop. Um, and the other issue is related to maybe what are the areas where you see the most um, relevant area for collaboration. You mentioned, I think, the transnational level um, in terms of uh, flood risk management. Maybe you can elaborate a few points on this. Oh, some difficult questions there, Marcus. Can you just repeat the, the last question, sorry, on, on flood management? Yeah, the last one was related to also because I think on the European level, also in revising the EU adaptation strategy, um, they are looking more and more on the relevant role in terms of transnational issues, which are not that well covered by the national level. And um, flood risk management could be one of those areas. And I'm just wondering how to include, for example, social issues and the SME sectors in these discussions. Okay, so I think <clears throat> the first thing I say is I don't think there's easy answers to the, these questions. And this is, this is a process that we need to go through and, and keep working on. So I think in, in terms of groups, I've, I've named some of the specific groups. I think also we need to, as a community, we need to work together more strongly to identify those, what those different groups are and to reach out to them and to explain what climate impacts mean as co concretely as we can for their community or work in the, almost in a workshop together to game through what those different, what those different climate scenarios mean for their sector and their 
their understanding. And that's some of the work that we do at the UN in relation to the to the Sendai framework is on disaster risk reduction is to work is to go into different countries, mainly because we work with national governments, we would go into different ministries, for example, like the transport ministry or the energy ministry with um, historical data on, on disasters and, and future projections and to try and get game through what that means for their sector. But it really, you have to work with them because they're, they, they know their sector. So for example, on transportation, so they can start to identify what it means. So it might mean that they need to change the materials that they use on the roads. They might need to move um, certain infrastructure away from like floodplains, issues, issues like that. Um, and then, so I can, after this call, I can give you like a list of some of the organizations that we work with that might be interesting to come to. But I think as a general point, I think we need to work more to identify who are the vulnerable groups to engage with. And then another point I'd like to mention is also the importance of engaging with the finance sector to think about the incentives around um, preventing investments in risky areas, for example, or preventing financial flows um, that result in greater climate impact. So some of the work that's been happening at the EU level on the sustainable finance is really important here. And you may have noticed in the most recent proposals coming out of the Commission that both disaster risk and climate impacts were were integrated into that and quite a strong part of the way that the Commission framed that that initiative. So I think that's quite an important area to engage with too and to then work with our communities at the, both in disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation so that they can help the finance community to understand where you need to make changes in <clears throat> investment flows and financial incentives. Yeah, thank you very much, Rosalind. I know those <laughs> questions are quite challenging. Um, thank you very much, and we, of course, it would be great to have this exchange afterwards as well. I've seen another hand raised by Nambi. Please. This is Nambi Apadre. I'm the uh, leader for the climate program at WRI in the office. And I'm basically an adaptation person. I've been working in adaptation for a long time. My question is somewhat related to the thanks for the excellent presentations. Uh, it is very, my knowledge, I ought to kind of confess, my knowledge in Europe is very limited. Uh, mostly I worked in Africa and India and um, in Asia. So, you know, one of the things, you know, while we are so tuned to look at the future and you know, excellent uh, scenarios and whatever, but uh, in the adaptation context, what matters is the past as well. How do you kind of, you know, consolidate the gains made uh, so far and incorporate that in the future scenario? That, that's a question which always, when it comes to adaptation, it, as you all know, it is a kind of a multi-dimensional, multi-sectoral issue and very localized kind of thing. It's, it's always there is a struggle to kind of consolidate these things, particularly in a time when you're talking from moving from incremental changes to the transformative pathways. How do you define this within the scenario? Uh, it's going to be a challenge, you know, to... Uh, uh, that's my first part of the question. Secondly, I'm also kind of intrigued by... There are so many commissions, you know. There's another one I recently, you know, we are part of the Global Commission Adaptation, uh, which has been constituted and, you know, it's just still, still shaping up. There are quite a few kind of, you know, bodies working on these things, you know. How do they contribute, you know, with the, the kind of sound knowledge base, what we have, how do you harness those energies as well in doing this exercise? I'll stop here. <clears throat> Okay, thank you very much. Maybe Ian, do you want to take the first part of the question? Yes, I, I'd, I'd be happy to. I mean, I think that the main way that that we try to embed that sort of current understanding into the scenarios within the Impressions Project is by um, working with stakeholders to develop those scenarios. So rather than it being the scientists developing them, it's the stakeholders and those those European SSPs, and we've done them at multiple scales from Europe to national to transnational river basin to local. They start from the current, so they have the current situation um, em embedded into them. But what I think is, is particularly important as well is, is to recognize that all, 
all of this um, all of this future change in our ability to respond to it is multi-scalar and the act that you know the 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 actors who are able to um, respond to these challenges are different at every scale and even in something like flood risk management that might be a transnational um, it might be transnational actors that act that would deal with that for the large river basins for fluvial flooding but for smaller river basins or for, for localized fluvial flooding it would be a very different set of actors that would be um, would be responding and I think we need to recognize that there isn't that sort of one size fits all thank you yeah thank you very much Ian um, maybe a quick answer to your second point that you raised is about there are so many commissions and bodies and platforms and other things. What we are trying to do within Placard is to provide a, provide, um, a platform where actually those, um, those different actors and platforms can meet. So it's uh, global initiatives like Prevention Web or We Adapt, but it's also more European specific ones. Um, like, for example, Climate Adapt and also platforms, but it should also give a space to the different uh, national actors. So that's the way we're trying to um, put those different actors into contact and um, use the different commissions and bodies that are there, like uh, before um, our colleague from UNISDR Europe, and so I think um, there are already some relevant exchanges and collaborations started. I've seen also that Jonathan uh, was raising his hand. Please, Jonathan. Thank you. Um, I wanted to come back with some of the issues that, that Rosy has raised, in, in particular on the inequality of uh, climate vulnerability across Europe. And, and I think this is crucial when connecting this agenda into an EU policy and an EU politics lens. Uh, part of the uh, part of the overall European mission in recent decades has been to uh, to try to uh, build cohesion um, between countries and to enable solidarity between countries. Um, so this risk of a of a growing inequality in who is most exposed to climate impacts uh, and who is you know least insured for those climate impacts, I think, uh, has become. Um, quite an important part of, of the political story that needs to be told. Uh, linking it to the related question of, of kind of which groups uh, do we need to engage um, in this project and, and in other projects, um, it is a very challenging issue because almost by definition, um, some of the, you know, the, the most vulnerable are also uh, some of the, the, the least resourced and the least organized. Um, so, in comparison to, say, you know, kind of the the, the various business associations uh, that are that are present in Brussels, uh, the, the the gas industry, the coal industry, uh, etc., um, you know, there, there is no association of, of kind of climate vulnerable communities that is that is there or or, or able to be there. Um, so, I think we need to figure out other ways of, of addressing um, that that gap within the debate. Um, finally, one, one further thought about practical actions and, and things to, to take forward. Um, I think there is an appetite as part of the future of, uh, of Europe discussion to also think about practical steps, um, you know, kind of uh, measures that can be taken that are, that are kind of big enough to be significant at, at, at European level, but still deliverable over, over the next five years. To, to build into this agenda of, of, of how to take it forward. Um, I understand that uh, the Commission had been thinking of, of developing a paper on, the, um, on looking at the future of EU energy and climate policy to 2025. Um, so that may be one channel that this group could take, uh, would be uh, to kind of go beyond the constraints perhaps of the EU adaptation strategy as is, and, and thinking slightly more big picture of, um, you know, if if uh, solidarity on on uh, managing climate risk is core to the European future, you know, what are the commensurate efforts that would need to be taken at European level uh, to, to properly address that? 
Yes, thank you very much, Jonathan, for this um, for this thought. And it actually leads perfectly to the next slide, and we can use uh, now 10 minutes to focus more on this question, which is about exactly what you mentioned. What are the enablers to getting actually towards this uh, climate resilient Europe? And what are those enablers that we see maybe on different sides? On the one hand, uh, coming from the policy side, can be strategies or action plans, but also coming from practitioner side and also from research. So. Um, I see actually uh, Rob's hand raised. Uh, I'm not sure if it was related to that question. Uh, it, Rob, you want to give it a? Short statement, okay, if it's not the case. Um, so we, we were talking now about most of the challenges. Um, now we need to think about, okay, what are the responses to those risks and to, to this rather uncertain future? Um, maybe targeting in the direction that was already raised by Jonathan about um, the focus and the direction that, for example, the next uh, placard workshop can take in the field of foresight in order to really try to increase this coherence between CCA and DRR in Europe. Um, I see Rosalind's hand raised. I'm not sure if that's from before or if it's um, a second time. Oh, hi. It was actually from before, but I can, I can add something anyway. Um, I think one of the enablers is to <clears throat> is to have a better understanding of the of the, the broader landscape both internationally and and in Europe and what are the key um, where are the key moments and elements where we could bring together those those two communities and and provide useful input into those processes. So one is the future of Europe debate that was outlined hopefully by Jonathan. I think we've also <clears throat> can see other ones, for example, the national adaptation plans that will be <clears throat> submitted under the UNFCCC process. But under the Sendai framework, um, governments are encouraged to have national and local disaster risk reduction strategies. And at a technical level, there's collaboration between UNFCCC and the different UN bodies to ensure integration. But when we have those big political moments and <clears throat> looking at those plans, those, those are moments to, to bring together those communities and, and talk about what are the, what's happening, what's at stake, and what are the choices that we that we need to be making. So I think that workshop could perhaps pull, already have a first idea of, of what are those key processes and elements where this community needs to come together and, and and strongly engage together to have a have a better um, coordination and push together. Yeah, thank you very much, Rosalind. I see also uh, Rob's hand raised. Yeah, thanks, uh, Marcus. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, because actually I tried to say something before, but um, I think I pushed the wrong button because my original question was actually related to your earlier question, but I still think it's relevant and it relates in a way to uh, Rosalind's uh, point. Um, if you actually look at uh, what's also in the chat box, uh, we tend to think about uh, say the kind of well normal sectors like agriculture, forestry, water management, so the, the issues that also uh, Ian has uh, elaborated on, but the international aspect I think is also uh, important and also very relevant I think for European policy. Uh, you already mentioned uh, migration yourself. Uh, of course, this is a rather controversial issue. Climate change is just one of many, many other factors that drive migration, but uh, well, it's coming uh, back to, on the agenda every once in a while. There's now a, a new report I think by the World Bank also uh, warning about uh, huge uh, masses of people moving around uh, in countries and between continents. But this is really high on the political agenda of the EU and could also be one of the areas that we can think about. And the same applies to security. 
Uh, again, climate change is only one of the many factors, but, uh, but also it's high on the political agenda. So it's worthwhile maybe to also think of uh, policies and practices in those areas beyond the kind of traditional um, climate issues such as uh, heat waves, floods, uh, and so forth. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Rob. Um, are there additional uh, participants who want to to comment on those points mentioned before, or who want to actually um, contribute in a way also the direction of the second uh, workshop? If I'm not seeing a hand raised, uh, what Rob was also mentioning before, and what you see here is, if you look at the Placard Foresight report, you see that we identify three different relevant processes that are currently going on or starting soon, which is the revision of the EU adaptation strategy, where also, of course, the EU member states have a role. Then the civil protection mechanism, and there are also EU most of the EU member states, but also um, additional countries involved in it. And the last point that Rob mentioned related to research needs and developments is the framework program nine, where um, work has started. Um, one of the ideas could be that, for example, more um, foresight exercises or issues or different trends need to be reflected in some of, of the projects, also focusing maybe more on, like was mentioned by Rosalind, on the more vulnerable groups related to certain types of hazards. Um, so if there are any thoughts that are coming up from you, eh, please uh, let us know in the chat or email us afterwards. That would be very he helpful. Um, in the last five minutes, um, I would like to focus on um, the issues and the follow-up activities that, are take, that will be taking place. The one is the second placard um, foresight workshop, which will be in autumn 2018, most likely in Brussels, because several actors are there. But if you have another um, issue, please, or other suggestions, please let us know. Um, then I'm not sure if you're familiar, there will be the European Climate Change Adaptation Conference 2019 in Lisbon. And we are also aiming for a foresight session, also in involving in this more climate change adaptation conference, more actors and stakeholders from uh, the disaster risk reduction, disaster risk management community. Um, and this is also something that maybe we can talk about with, with Rosalind, but also with others of you. Um, are there any additional suggestions or issues where you see this uh, connected to um, or other ongoing initiatives where we could liaison with? Um, this would be a question from my side. Uh, there's the hand raised from Rosalind or still from before, cannot distinguish. No, I just raised it again. I would just like to add from our side that we'll be holding uh, a European Forum for Disaster Risk Reduction, which is um, a regional platform that we hold in Europe every two years. And it'll be this year it's hosted in Italy in November. And one of the key themes is on how to help and support the disaster risk re reduction community to um, to better understand what climate change means for, for what it means for their work. So we would be happy to talk further off, offline on how we could collaborate at a, at a session at, at that platform. It will bring together hundreds, um, hundreds of people from, from around the European region. Okay, thank you very much, Rosalind, for this opportunity. Um, I don't see another hand uh, raised. Maybe going on the last one, and I already mentioned it before, there will be the European Climate Change Adaptation Conference, and you see the web link here. Um, we would be very welcoming a participation from your side, or you suggest some stakeholders. There are opportunities to get involved in it. And as you can see from the conference themes, um, that very relevant is this interface here between climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction. Also, we try to accommodate more the global challenges that we talked about. And here, instruments like climate risk management or resilience to uh, better 
actually ensure more coherence between also this topic here, institutions, governance, citizens, and research. Um, so this was it from our side. If you'd like to get in contact with, with us, please do it via the placard website. Here are my email contacts. The information that you saw from the different slides will be made available, and we will inform you about this. And um, having said that, I would like to thank all our panelists for their contribution. Thank you very much for providing the slides and presenting. Thank you very much for um, being involved in our webinar. Um, and I hope to hear again from you soon, whatever comes up your mind or you think there are additional points that are of relevance, please let us know and we will make a short summary of the, the outcomes of this webinar available to you.